Oh, hi, podcast listeners. There's many ways you can listen to The Real Nerds Podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes. You can also subscribe on Stitcher Radio. You want to send us a Twitter message? You can do that. It's so easy, at Real Nerds. Like us on Facebook, Real Nerds Podcast. You can visit our website, realnerdspodcast.com, where there will be a lot of articles for you to not only read, but to listen to our previous shows. Do you like your stories told through pictures? Then you can also follow us at Real Nerds on Instagram. You can also call us, 720-6Nerds5. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Well, a real nerd knows who shot a real nerd. Welcome back to Real Nerds Podcast. Uh, I am your sometimes host, Zach, and with me is your much more regular presence on the show, Mr. Brad. I'm here. Brad, who are we here to talk to? What are we doing here? What What are we doing here? Uh, we're doing a, a real interview with a filmmaker. Woo! Ooh. Could it, would it happen to be the director of a film that features one of the best puppet fights I've ever seen in my life? <laughs> I hope so. All right. Well, I, I, if that's the case, then I think we have the right gentleman in the studio. Please welcome Mr. Nick Roth. I am so happy to be here and be uh, associated with a, a puppet fight as my main <laughs> bullet point. Yeah, very few people have it. And Happy Time Murders. Not enough. And Happy Time Murders disappointed me so grandly that this this made up for it. Um, okay. Yeah. So- I, that's what we're hoping to do. We're really <laughs> hoping to make up for the the entire Puppet Master franchise. Look, Brian Henson had one job to do, which is to make a movie as magical and dirty as his father might have made it, and he just failed. But you succeed in in a place that he failed. Um, <laughs> I have a I have a question to kick this off because there's a couple of things I noticed about the film with watching a screener in advance. Okay, uh, what what gave you the uh, inclination to pursue a story this surreal? Like, what was the genesis of this? Well, uh, you know, I. This is just how my stupid brain works. I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you that was like, we really wanted to plumb the depths of weirdness, but I was like, oh, it's a napkin. The napkin can talk. And then, you know, from that, everything sort of like falls out from that. If you got a topic, talking napkin, well, what's his, he's going to get off on cleaning up messes, right? Like that's what else is a napkin going to be turned on by? You know, that just makes sense. So it it's actually quite logical. Like once you just sort of, I, I don't think of it as surreal, you know, I'm just trying to make it make sense. I think that the well, the entirety has a surreal functionality to it in the way you're playing with your visual spectrum, um, how you're playing with this ice shack with it's so small in the outside and big on the inside like a TARDIS, um, the the mushroom sequence in general. Like those are those are just like lovely things that I appreciate of a film that's not afraid to kind of go uh, go off into the into the irreverent. Uh, so I, I guess like where, when did the, when did the gen, when did the origin of it begin? Like, when did you come up with this idea? Like, cause I saw that you made a short of this prior. The short, we made a short, the, t- the most of us who were involved in the feature had worked on the short, a bunch of us at least. And, uh, the short was really a very innocent sort of much more like a maybe PG 13 story about like a, a guy and his talking napkin being on a date and they're on, you know, it's a sort of unlikely romance and. But then the idea was we go underneath the table where you get both napkins talking to each other and they sort of, you know, are re- somehow representative of the like the id or the unconscious or whatever you want to say is like the awkwardness of a date sort of through the eyes of like what's on your lap. Right. Um, but there's no, you know, murder and mayhem and uh, gore and nudity and, you know, all the things that we then were like, well, once we get to a feature now, finally, we can have this napkin, you know, have an epic wire food duel and all the things that you want to have in the short right so so when you got so when you you come to the feature film realm your 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 next step point was basically to kind of pull into a interdimensional uh horror film yeah 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 well i mean i love an alien invasion movie and and it's not they're not easy to pull off with puppets and no money but you know we did our best I think you I think you absolutely succeeded at the goal there because like something that I like about it is well one the interdimensional aspect isn't until the third of the film. We may have to put a spoiler uh <laughs> warning at the buff because I don't want to 
<laughs> it's totally fine. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think this is this isn't a movie that really relies on twists and plots to get you through it. You know what I mean? It's a comedy. It's yeah. funny. And I think it's funny. It's just as funny if you know where it's going, even though you probably don't. Absolutely. Well, actually, I didn't. I, I knew that we were dealing when I saw the trailer, I knew we were dealing with the napkin and the hat. Uh, but I wasn't inc incredibly aware of where it was going to go. Um, even at the midway point, when you have uh, when you have the Chardonnay drinking uh, uh, a cabin dweller talking with the napkin in the bathroom, I'm still like, OK, something's off here. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I do know that something different is going to happen than what I thought was going to happen in my head. My thought initially was evil dead, but with a hat with sentient hat. And yeah. And it it completely managed to twist my expectations, not the least of which with adding a government organization, uh, which I love the line akin to the uh, Men in Black. Yeah, I, I, it's not the Men in Black. It's just you know. But that's like I feel like this is a this is a a pet peeve and a hobby horse of mine. Is like people in movies always act like they haven't seen all the movies because you don't want to like overly reference movies. And it's like, but you, the actual CIA agents they're talking about Men in Black all the time. You think they haven't seen these movies? Like that's probably what they that's their language, right? And so like I always like in I appreciate in movies. I try to write it is that like th this is how we talk if we say oh it's like in this movie. Where whatever. So when she's going to go explain to them who she is, she's like, just I'm, it's basically men in black. You know what I mean? Like, just assume it's that. You know what that is. Everybody knows. It's better than having um, a grander idea of the the mythos you're creating. Like, you're not you're not J.R.R. Tolkien. You're not trying to build like a mythology for England. You are you are very much trying to get us from point A to point B to make that point. Um. Now I, but I did um, have a couple questions about the way you made the film. Like, first of all, like it's an independent sure. film. Um, it looks like you guys had a lot of fun making it. Can you talk about the process of not just writing this script but directing it um, with uh, Lindsay Hahn, your co-director? Yeah, I mean, this was an like, look. First of all, it's very, very collaborative. Like, I'm taking the writer's credit. I guess I wrote the draft, but like everybody really had a hand in writing and crafting it. We all kind of just made this thing together. We like. Um, the whole the, the the whole cast basically the main cast and Lindsay and I are we are like we really wrote the movie developed the idea did all of that together we all stayed in the cabin and we all living in this tiny little cabin while we made the movie um mm -hmm. and then like a lot of the story just sort of like fell out from like I don't know we'll kill people in the order that we have the availability of actors I think that makes the, the movie <laughs> kind of unpredictable because it's like when you when you sit down to write a script, and this was also I wrote this so long ago it was early in my screenwriting career. I definitely I not that I know so much what I'm doing now, but I definitely didn't know then. So it was like between those things, I don't think there's any uh, no one could predict where the movie goes because it doesn't make any it doesn't it doesn't like follow a lot of the rules of screenwriting. Um, and partly that's because it's like, oh, well, we're losing uh, Azure in two days. So we got to that character's got to die fast. <laughs> like. Yeah. Or I mean, I I die fast because I had to I I was needed in directing the film. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, you know. I I wanted to touch on that because you play. There's, <laughs> there's a couple of characters that each of the characters has a standout moment, but your character and your character's like uh, love interest that's being kept to locked behind a door. Yeah. Um, uh, it was uh, it was as very refreshing to watch this kind of like intellectual of this falutin intellectual in a robe, <laughs> um, just. <laughs> And, it, and I love how he doesn't get out of that robe really at all, even when he's outside. Never. Uh, he's, I think he's in it the whole. Well, no, it did. He he dress. He puts on a cardigan for dinner. But other than that, he's in the robe the whole time. Uh, yeah. And it's just like, oh, my God, that's commitment to to the to this bit here of just this this like, hey, hey. And the whole hagiography hey is not an actual thing uh, bit like did give me a nice little like <laughs> each time it was being called out. Um, And but I, I but when you were uh, directing as an actor, uh, how does that work for you? Like, how do you balance those two? Well, you, you, so it's co-directed with me, Lindsay and I co-directed and you may notice that mm -hmm. Dr. Crane and Rebecca are never in a scene together, um, which is by design because we were like, one, we can't be in scenes together. One of us always. So at least there's somebody who's directing um, while the other one is acting. Uh, and we didn't really have a crew. Mm -hmm. Like, at all like we had at any given time we had a dp and like maybe our friend sam to hold the boom sometimes and then and that's like that's basically it and then the we just had us and the cast so 
you know, the cast had to do their own sound, which is, <laughs> I think, maybe felt a little bit in the film. Um, but yeah, I was like, uh, uh, we need we need bodies. It's a horror movie. People got to die. And so um, everyone's got to be in it who's working on it, except for the except for the directors of photography. They're the only ones who who escaped that. We were like, you, we need somebody to be manning the camera at any given time. But everybody else, you got to be in the movie and you got to be on the crew. So they didn't have to get splattered around with paint uh, with uh, blood makeup effects and whatnot. Yeah, 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 they're the only ones who have escaped it so far. Yeah, we can actually talk like oh, that. Transitions me into the the way some of those some folks get get their demise. One of which is when they're wearing Harry the Hat. Hmm. All that blood is trickling down. Yeah, I just liked how it was nice and inventive. Like you didn't need to go too far. It's just right there, and it's just dripping down. It was like very. I got I got a nice little like, oh, my God, like this is a lot of this is a nice like splatter fest going on right now. Um, there's, there's just enough of it to, I think, be like a little like actual like it catches you off guard. Maybe it's so creepy. To, uh, there's a shout out is warranted here to Toby, Toby Bryan, who plays Norm. He's the voice of Woody. He did all the puppeteering. He's their special effects guy. Um so it was, it, there's somewhere there's somewhere I have a video I haven't published it yet, but somewhere there's a very funny video of Toby and I testing the blood bags inside the hat and just like putting a hat on our head quickly and having the blood go down to <laughs> to great or like trying to figure out how much blood, how fast does the blood need to drip? You, things you don't really think about until we were, it was literally like the night before we were shooting whatever. And we were like, we got to figure out the blood effect. Yeah, and it's and, and you're right because it does take you back for a second because the good chunk of the a good chunk of the first part of this movie is not really blood laden at all whatsoever. Like mm -mm. It's really going on, and then all of a sudden it kicks into high gear. Um, and what what I kind of noticed as I was watching it shift from those modes is that you were already from the get go blending a couple of different films in here. And oh yeah, shame to do it through the score. Um, I, I noticed, uh, the, the ones that I noticed off the top of my head were the shining at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then I, I got a bit of a sense of other horror films, maybe a Raimi vibe off through that. And then I got this, this basically Howard Shore esque middle earth score um, <laughs> for the final fight and whatnot. Did you instruct the composer to just go all out and try to recreate some of those vibes when, uh, getting that music together? Yeah, the composer, because okay, so the composer is Jimmy Hahn, Lindsay Hahn's dad. And that's actually his cabin where so the, the music was also composed in the cabin where we shot, too. Um, yeah. The, so I, when we we tempt, we made a, a temporary score with the, the score from The Shining was a big piece of that always. And this was always sort of like Lindsay's initial idea for the movie as uh, how she would approach it as, as a director was it's the shining but if leslie nielsen was playing jack so, <laughs> and so we were always like okay so the shining is a big piece of it it's a, you know a movie that's near and dear to all of our all of our hearts and if you're doing a sort of snowbound um family murder movie it, it, it was that, so yes that's that's a big piece of 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 where we were the the I'm not sure if I used any Howard Shore for in particular in the the temp score, but there was really it was always a really big sweeping orchestral um, oral uh, voices popping up and everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 Jimmy's fantastic and extremely versatile and can do just like anything. So I was like, I was like, I need you to do The Shining here. There's a little bit of this is got to get more like English patient over here, and then like uh, yeah, giant orchestral. I think I I think I used. Uh, like some of the inspiration pieces I gave him were like music from um, the Star Wars video games because they had that kind of like epic, fighty, um, gigantic. So this, so this may be a little bit of John Williams uh, in there, if, if not, if not Howard Shore. Uh, then, and I, um, I'm actually curious because of that that epic feel that you're underlaying in the final fight. Um, it kind of has an overall question about how you, as a director. And how your special effects guy handled this. Talk a little bit about the puppetry and how you were basically kind of motivating yourselves around that function. Because it's one thing to have a bunch of actors and get your shots off on and make your day. It's another to have this puppet element in the mix. How did that affect the way you guys were able to progress at a pretty reasonable rate? And like, how difficult was it to work with in those confines? 
It's def. I mean, look, having a having a, the puppets are very rudimentary, right? Because they don't even have really like moving parts. I mean, Woody, who's one of the main characters of the movie, is literally just a napkin, an unaltered. He is a napkin. But then there's a lot of things that we did to sort of bring him to life a little bit more. I think that Toby's sort of hand. I mean, Toby's a serious puppeteer and a real puppet builder. So it's not like it was just like, it, he's much better than if it was just me with my hand. Like, and I think Toby brought a lot of life to the character by doing, you know, live recording the voice with the movements. And Toby really got into the sort of hand of it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, a, a decision that was made between Lindsay, who was really working more closely with the DPs. I was more like the director who was also the writer who was working on Tr trying to I, look i just wanted the movie to be funny that was all i was focused on was just actors, like, funny 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 can i get it be funny yeah. um but Lindsay and the dps worked out this cool thing where they um you know altered the shutter speed of the camera when we're on woody so it just sudden subtly gives this kind of unreal effect just a little bit and it changes the way that the camera is uh like catching movement so there's like little tiny things like that that were that i thought were really cool um mm -hmm. and then Look, during there was at least one moment where we were moving so fast because it was puppets that we forgot to shoot Woody's close up, and that's a problem too. Because usually you have, an, if you have a human actor, it's a lot harder to do that. You're like, okay, we need to turn it around on you know Jacob or Ashley or whatever. Um, but there was definitely a, a, a let's just say a key moment in the film where we just never shot a close up of uh, Woody and realize it's the moment at the end of the movie where he says the titular line of the film, we got hanky panky. And so I had to like go reconstruct it by, um, I did, I managed to digitally remove like Harry from a, a another moment where Woody was talking and then digitally zoom in and turn it into a close up. Um, mm -hmm. But like, that's the, that's one an unforeseen challenge of working with uh, napkin mm -hmm. puppets. Right. Well, I and I, I with that puppetry in mind and the way you're affecting the shutter speed, that that makes a lot of sense now hearing that because it do, it does feel in tune with the rest of the film. It doesn't yeah. nothing feels like it's off off to the side in terms of like the the visuals don't shift strictly unless you, the director or Lindsay as the director are saying so in the edit. Nothing is shifting from the visual spectrum you've already set up. Um, mm -hmm. And also you you handled your your Foley beautifully to match each movement that was clearly hitting with the best take that you had. Um, it was very, very lovely to watch that. Um, and the Harry puppet uh, was a very lovely, surreal in in invention. Uh, that thing looked looked groggy as sin. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely fantastic to he's come. like adam he's i actually have him right here he's he's with oh, me oh no, no. <laughs> he's a little worse for where his peacock feather eyes have rotted off but um you know he's still there there's still i still have the gaffer's tape that holds the blood bags inside of his head so i love the uh the the function of the rim of the hat has the teeth inside of it like a job like yeah very lovely little addition to the detail. This is that's all Toby. Toby sort of made it. Isn't he? was like, I'll give him a little bit of a tongue, and <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, when when you see it up close with the shutter speed, I'll I forget if it's sped up or slowed down. I'm bad with technical stuff, but like, it it does give him a, a kind of like fun, creepy flair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he fits right within that ice shack motif, and then yeah. when, when you have him placed upon uh, other people's heads. Uh, that that just gives off this uh, amazing like it's already uh, an, an unsettling image on top of what's going to be an unsettling performance from anybody who's wearing it and or anybody who's yeah. getting the wrath of him. I really appreciated that. Um, so when uh, from from start to finish, how long has the film been like how long have you been constructing it up to this point? Is, was this like over the course of a year? How long did this take you to, to put together? So we assembled the idea for we developed it and wrote the script and sort of prepped really that was only a few months we shot it in like three most of it was shot in three weeks and then some of it a little bit a couple weekends later were sort of pickups uh and then Lindsay and i spent seven years editing it because it was a real bear and we were doing it in our spare time and so it took just a, a, an enormously long i think the the real tremendous um boon that we got out of that was that like this was a movie where that really benefited from us being able to sort of take a few months off here and there mm -hmm. come back with i mean take a year off maybe at one point and really come back with fresh eyes because it's very hard to edit oh look we had never edited a movie we didn't know what we were doing we were um 
learning as we went a lot of it we'd only edited shorts and music videos before this and um it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot and we had to figure out what the movie was and really put it together um in the in the cutting room so it, it we spent a long time doing that and we finished it we picture locked right before the writer's strike <laughs> So then you sit down and wait. Well, and then we and then uh, we did like I did the color and sound and all that during the strike, actually. Nice. Nice. And so like so did you like I I appreciate you finding a benefit in taking that long to edit because most people I would I might encounter may not like feel that way. They they have a turnaround in their mind. Um, But if it's something that you're dedicating your time and passion to, there's no time limit on that. Um, it's- yeah, it was just the the movie's not it's not there yet and it can get better. And, you know, it, it was mostly just cutting it shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it's now it's this very crisp 86 minutes and change. Mm-hmm. But it, it took a lot to get to. And, you know, things came out and went back in. And there's a lot that's on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah, you're you're not only right about that crisp tight. What? Uh, 82, 86, 86. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. You're 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 a. Uh, let's put aside the puppets and the sci-fi and the horror elements here for a second. The first third of this reminded me of a screwball comedy, which yeah. I really, really appreciated. Like the, the editing is very, very tight. Uh, and it, and these characters feel like they're walking in and out of a, of a press office and his girl Friday, the way they're kind of maneuvering in and out. Um, like the, I was very, very impressed by how you managed to, kind of fit all of that in like did you did you start off i'm wondering actually just as an editor to editor did you start off giving them a little more space and then realizing you had to like compress it or was that the idea from the get-go i mean i think that we were from the get-go we were trying to compress it and then we compressed it as much as we could in performance then we compressed it as much as we could in post because it was all like you know there was a lot of emphasis on like clue is a good example of sort of yeah. like yes. cabin murder mystery but also we wanted that incredibly quick um Mm. it's not we i hesitate to invoke clue too much because there's pieces that are superficially very similar to clue but i think like tonally we were going for a very different kind of humor than clue but with some of that like fast talking and obviously murder mystery in a cabin right but you know clue is we had jokes that were more clue like jokes wordplay jokes most of that we cut out we were like this is actually not the direction we want to go in we want to have it be this sort of weirdly it's more grounded in a lot of ways like and and it's kind of i think it's really great to throw people in this okay so here's this crazy thing but then let's treat that realistically and what would happen what would really happen how would you really react if this insane thing was happening you're not cranking it to total to, ludicrous speed essentially if, if we were mm-hmm. using complex terminology you're not going to ludicrous speed you're maybe going toward ridiculous speed and, yeah and there's a there's a definite like i got clue vibes but it was a, a a larger drawing room mystery aesthetic at large. Yeah, um, you could apply that to like how how they're how um, Ryan Johnson's pulling off his Knives Out films recently, where it's just it's a bunch of people in a room. We are trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, different relationships are being formed in and out of the cabin, um, and there, there's something about the speed of it that worked very well without going into a one a, a full. 500 percent of clue right. like it's the speed is exactly where it needs to be yeah uh, a thing that's always on my mind structurally is jurassic park which is like we so we open there's a cold jurassic park opens you don't even you don't see the raptor but you see a guy get killed right this this isn't in reinventing the wheel but then the, you know then there's 45 50 minutes i think after that where there's no violence. There's nothing bad that happens. There's some eeriness or whatever, but it's all just character building and slowly building suspense until it's nighttime and it's raining and the and the electrics go down and the T-Rex comes out. But that's half of the midpoint of that film, I think, is is Mama T-Rex gets out and eats the lawyer off the toilet, right? Spoiler alert on Jurassic Park. But <laughs> it's the... um had plenty of time to do it. <laughs> yeah. If, anybody, if there's anybody listening to this podcast who somehow missed Jurassic Park... Stop the podcast now. Go watch Jurassic Park. You got um, the you got the one guy who in '93 just <laughs> like, what they did what now with dinosaurs? What I'm curious in this creature horror film, but I've never seen Jurassic. Park. Anyway, my point is that like yeah, so so I think that there's you know there's good reason audiences aren't going to be I, I think like disappointed that it takes a long time to get to back to oh and now people are getting killed again. 
I don't think they will. I don't think they're they're gonna have any reason to di- be disappointed. They're in for a fun time. I I enjoy myself. <laughs> like as somebody who's been, uh, I, we were talking off mic how I've been like running around with a head like a chicken with the head cut off. It was nice to sit back with a film that just em- embraced the irreverent, embraced the madness, and just had fun with itself. It, it was a great treat. Um, I want to know though how other people can experience this film. What is the plan here? Where where does it go at this point? Where are we okay? Going? Somehow we did get a distributor. The movie is coming out on actual platforms, which feels crazy. I think after somewhere in the seven years of editing, most of the people who worked on it just thought this was disappearing and never getting finished. And when I was like, hey, I finished the movie. Everyone was like, what movie? What the hell are you talking about? It is coming <laughs> <I> out. <didn't... laughs> we made a movie. It's a real movie. Uh, and it's coming out April 19th on VOD. And so it'll be on Apple, Amazon, Google, and then all the everything else. The ones with really, really funny names. Hoopla voodoo fandango or whatever <laughs> um, yeah so it'll be on all the really fun stuff on uh on vod for the in, in time to celebrate your 420 weekend uh wow. friday april 19th i'm 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 uh i'm i'm sober myself but i think people who do engage in the sticky icky will quite enjoy uh what you have to offer them it's got a lot of uh it's i don't think of it as a stoner comedy but our distributor does and it's sort of you know it's got a lot of features of uh that kind of irreverent absurdist psychedelic humor i think but i think additionally not just within that within that 420 vibe um i think you i think you do manage to weave a fun a, a fun tale of comedy horror that does that does have fun with its premise like you it, the the joy of making the film is all over the film it's not yeah. there's no cynicism involved there's no th- nobody feels dishonest uh, on screen and no, and the film itself doesn't feel dishonest. So that that honesty, I think, is going to bleed into people checking out the film, my friend. Thank you so much, because that is so much the the intention behind this was just like, let's make a movie. Let's have as much fun. I think I feel like this movie has big people pleaser energy, too, where it's like, I don't want to like we're it's so we're so hyper conscious. We don't want to waste anybody's time. Everything has to be good and funny in it. Like, let's just make it the absolute best that we can. I think that there's a lot of times where um super low budget comedy horrors and some of them are great and i enjoy them still but like are like well this can be bad right Mm -hmm. like or or we can sort of own intentionally being bad or call it parody and have that part be bad or whatever and and maybe that's like cynicism like you're saying like that is not that was not our attempt our attempt was like this movie is silly this movie is zany but we are going to commit a hundred percent to making it as legitimately good as we possibly can if you i feel like if maybe this is a good way to 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 wrap it up is like if this film were trying to be a parody or trying to um like poke fun at itself too much i don't think that the heart of the woody character would be in full fashion like it's mm. so weird like the thing that i notice is like the the performance of woody is this very like grounded some sounds like he maybe comes from the east coast uh interdimensional being stuck in a napkin that is that that is does have like feelings for the people he's surrounded with he cares about sam he cares about the people in his life like i i love the whole idea is like no sam i i know i try to like con you into cleaning up messes but this (laughs) is have to go (laughs) like that 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 i think if you were to make the woody character like not give a crap then the movie wouldn't work and the fact that he yeah. doesn't give a crap about the people that he's interacting with it's kind of like the muppets like if you don't believe that you're talking to kermit the frog this premise doesn't work uh and so i i do think that you've built something that's genuine uh on on this footing so i think it i think it's a good achievement sir and uh, uh, thank you so much i think another piece of like what mo- makes woody work as well as he does i mean it's a whole ensemble is so good around him that that them playing the actor human actors playing off him i think it's a huge piece especially jacob damani finn who plays sam who is, has all of these emotional scenes with woody and like he is, I think he's a very talented actor, right? Like, and his ability to sell the seriousness of this relationship that he has with his handkerchief. Like, I think we really believe that he they have like a 30 year history or whatever, 20 something years of like backstory between them and this whole relationship. And um, and that, that's there's a lot that's a, a lot of pressure was put on Jacob to really sell that as 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 the human half of the of the pair. 
he provides just enough vulnerability to make that role work. Right. It's actually he's he's got a very like I I I admire the timidness he brought to the performance and then how it builds because at a certain point when he's when they're when they're talking about not mentioning the the mutated head on the back of that woman like that that was probably my favorite <laughs> like character interaction in the movie going like you could have said something about it <laughs> like that was that yeah it's that vulnerability if he doesn't sell it then the movie doesn't work and if the puppet doesn't sell his sincerity then the movie doesn't work everybody is very sincere about the job that they're performing yeah um, even when they're doing silly stuff i think they're doing it as if it's th these these actors really committed hard to the bit Agreed. Well, before we go, remind everybody, I know you talked about it, but do it again because we want to get people to watch this film. Where yeah. are they going to be able to find it? When is it coming out? How can they watch it? So April 19th, everywhere online. I think you just Google it and it comes up. Amazon will probably be the most reliable place to find it, you know, but it'll also be on Apple, uh, Apple, Google, Apple TV, Google Play, whatever Voodoo is called in a couple of weeks. Fandango, I think. Uh Pending yeah. at home again. What? <laughs> Homeward bound. Pending. I don't know. Whenever I want to watch anything, I just Google it now can, to figure out where to watch it because I have no idea where anything is. So, yeah, I understand. I think, I think probably people can do that. You can also find us at hankypankythemovie.com. And if you screw up and just type hankypankymovie.com, guess what? <laughs> I bought I bought both domains. <laughs> so, 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 you're good. Hanky Wonderful. Panky Movie. Uh, not to be confused with uh, Hanky Panky the Underwear. <laughs> um, which is a, a parent. I, we didn't know this at, at the time. A, there's a big underwear company called Hanky Panky. So we're, we're in a, we're, we're, we're not winning the C SEO battle with them yet, but right. hopefully, hopefully never, one day. Never say never. All we got to wait for is, is either the, well, the film should blow up, but if it doesn't, for whatever reason, we just got to wait for Hanky Panky underwear to collapse under itself and then they'll be gone. Yeah. They're complete. Or better, uh, some kind of partnership for the sequel guys. You know what I mean? It could be Hanky is Panky presents Hanky Panky too. Is there a sequel in mind uh, that that may be? Oh, the whole thing is in my head. I have the movie exists. It's up here, and it's it's uh it's it goes much harder. Let's just say there are more hats. There are more hankies. There's, like there's it's just more of everything. It's Independence Day, like on acid. <laughs> nice, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for sitting down to chat with us about your film. We were so happy to talk with you. Brad, uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for this real interview. Should we switch it over back to the main programming? Um, or just uh, the regular programming, because we might have just put this on YouTube without the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Fantastic. Um, um, hey, I do have one question, though. Oh, um, yeah. Which you've been talking all the time. Um, the Cheers references, obviously, you must be huge Cheers fans. Um is there no, hate reason, cheers. No, <laughs> yeah. Um, the 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 cheers thing came out of when we when we initially did the the short film. Uh, it was for one of those like projects where you have forty eight hours to make a movie, and oh, so so we were like, okay, we got forty eight hours, and we got a character named Sam, and I was like, I got to name all these other characters. I don't have time to name them, so I was like, uh, pff, Diane, Cliff, Carlo, Woody, uh, go as a like a placeholder, but then. Once it was a placeholder, I was like, that's a that's actually very funny. Let's commit to that and uh, just make every character in the movie named after the characters from from Cheers. That is the that is the end of where the I think the the Cheers references go. Well, even got but the logo of the movie. But of course, the uh, yeah. the logo of the, the, the film is it's the Cheers font, but then it flies in space like Star Wars and it's got music that is reminiscent of The Shining. We're uh, like, I think it's pretty clear. We're just like we're all over the place movie buffs and and film and television lovers who uh you know who very freely uh picked and choose pick picked and chose um <laughs> you know all kinds of references that's cool i like it wonderful well thank you so much again nick and that's going to wrap it up for this real interview dig back over to realnerdspodcast.com and check us out on all of our socials to hear more real inter real interviews as well as our movie reviews our film explosions etc all that wonderful stuff at real nerds podcast until next time bye well, a real nerd knows who shot a real nerd.